Welcome back to the Van Investors Club. I'm your host, Timo Von Let's get right into it with the VIC readings, the format where we look at the best of the best value investment recommendations by the best of the best value investors out there. Today we have CF Industries, uh, Industries Holdings Inc. tickers CF. Price of the point of funding is $67.36. And, uh, 36 cents. and let me first say this is not a recommendation, not advice. Please do your own diligence before investing into anything and let's get right into it. Description. CF Industrial Holdings, uh, the largest nitrogen fertilizer producer in North America, has been written up six times previously on VSC, and most recently three years ago this month. It also happens uh, to be uh, the largest position in Greenblatt's GVLU Daily Rebalanced ETF, which was referred to in a March podcast as representing a portfolio that has historically produced plus 63% two-year returns, approximately 28% IRR from its then valuation. More, more on that immediately below. This is meant to be an overview and update to a story that is going to be quite familiar to many investors out there. And But for those unfamiliar, uh, there's plenty to catch the eye. CF was valued at a 19.9% free cash flow yield in its uh, fifth uh, fifth second uh, Q1 earnings presentation. 16.5% as stated, but when including the impact of uh, 491 million of uh, Canada uh, slash US tax matter that uh, the company has filed amended returns to recover, it should adjust to 19.9%. The stock is down 5% since uh, that earnings report, so it hasn't exactly run away from its valuation. This 20% free cash flow yield is significant production margin advantages versus European and Asian producers given the forward energy spread uh, spreads in North America and a strong capital market allocation history that combines strategic initiatives with stock repurchasing seems a compelling starting point. Importantly, unlike other FCF stories, this company carries a very, very little debt uh, net debt and has been accumulating a significant amount of cash 2.3 billion uh, current cash on hand while they were completing a recent acquisition more on that later first though back to why cf was chosen for this write-up cf industries holding is the largest position in the joel greenblatt managed daily rebalanced etf gotham 1000 value etf symbol gvlu during an Investors Chronicle podcast interview on 3rd, 4th, 14th, 23, Joe Greenblatt made some interesting comments about the prospective return profiles of the stock market. The key elements are bolded below in the section that begins around a 734 mark and continues to 1054. For instance, we have a strategy that always tie tries to reweigh the portfolio daily towards the cheapest 20% of our universe and let's say it's say the 1400 largest stocks in the US. If that's our universe, uh, we're always trying to reweigh the portfolio towards the 20% cheapest base on a trailing free cash flow the way that we define it relative to what we're paying. So how much free cash flow are we getting relative to the price we're paying? We have a portfolio that always reweighs it uh, towards the cheapest 20% and then we can go back over the last 30 years or so and say where are we today for the bucket of uh, companies you know that cheapest 20% relative to the last 30 years. And when I look uh, this morning we were in the 94th percentile towards cheap for the bucket that we could create today for the portfolio. That theoretical portfolio and that means there's a lot of companies uh, that at least based on trading earnings we can buy at a very good cash free cash flow yields and the market's only been cheaper for creating that bucket six percent of the time over the last 30 years and then you say hey what's happened from the 94th percentile in the past and the answer is uh, to that is what happens in the past from this valuation level, uh, the answer is plus 63% over the next two years for that bucket of companies. And that's constantly updated. So pretty good opportunity set for that section of the market. 
We can do some. Uh, we can do the same analysis for the S and P five hundred, and that, that's uh, quite a big difference. Still positive, but the S and P's, um, but that's in roughly the twenty seven percentile towards expansive over the last thirty years. Two year forward returns are closer to about seventy percent, not sixty three, but seventy percent. For the S and P five hundred, that's sub normal returns for the last thirty years, but not negative, but not the nearly. Uh, Op the opportunity set presented by the cheapest section so it's a real dichotomy dichotomy in opportunity sets and uh, that's why it's important to look at individual stocks as i said a market of the stocks not a stock market our definition of value is cash flow oriented not low price book or low price sales type definition and we actually view these as companies that you value and try to buy at a discount that's our definition of value investing. And given a cash flow oriented view, there are some really great opportunity sets. And this type of investing, well, it's actually done fine. It hasn't way outperformed the S&P over the last dozen years or so. But the opportunity set, you know, I feel the rubber band has stretched for this section of the market to such a degree that the next, you know, two, three, four years should give it a big advantage. And that's the way it's setting up right now for me. The daily rebalance ETF that he's talking about is a GVLU and there's additional information on the Gotham homepage. For additional perspective, using the 3-13th uh, 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 closing prices, GVLU has rallied from $18.28 to $90.32, today 6.823 for a gain of 5.7%. For additional perspective, using the 3-13th, oh sorry, uh, the S&P 500 using a ticker SPY has rallied from 385.36 uh, to 429.13 during the same period for a gain of 11.4%. Be by the way, if a CF doesn't interest you, uh, there have been uh, VSC write-ups with the most recent write-up linked and provided below for 9 of the top dozen holdings in the GVLU. CF, Dino, NSID, um, or NS. IT, TGNA, ED, PSX, VLO, LNG, MPC, IMO, Wire, UTHR. You can piece together your own GVLU right up from there. Now back to CV Industrial Holdings. The current share price of $67.36 represents a $13.1 billion market cap and 8.9x NTM forward PE, 4.5x LTM trailing PE and 5.5x NTM EV EBITDA, 2.8x training and a 2.4% dividend yield. CF's capital structure includes 3.25 billion of debt offset with 2.8 billion of cash for an enterprise value of 13.6 billion. During the previous 12 months, they repurchased 6.2% of their shares. The company has a historical record of combined share repurchases with a capacity growth such that on a per share basis, participation in CF's nitrogen volumes has grown at a 10% CAGR since 2009. As VSE contributor AFGTT2008 points out in their 2020 write-up, CF has two structural advantages a feedstock advantage and transportation advantage. Given that the US is a net importer of approximately one-seventh of its annual consumption of urea, a CF benefits from marginal price levels uh, being set by international production while retaining the advantageous low cost of North American natural gas. As an aside, um, one of the challenges of, of VIC is trying to add anything beyond updates to ideas that have already been eloquently explained before. I'm not one to pretend that I bet on my insights over those of AFGTT 2008 or in previous write-ups that was shared by uh, Biffins. See of write-up for 30th 2019, BLMS value rookie 964 and um, Ruby 831. Those six write-ups represent 63 pages of uh, summaries and comments uh, threads uh, that might prove to be a fun input for a little side project of an AI, of an AI bot for CV, um, CF, sorry, but I'd rather not construct something like that without permission of the authors and the BIC powers that be. In a nutshell, here are some take key takeaways from the these 15 years of VIC write-ups. 
China has previously had an outsized effect on the world of price of urea. But given its dependence on the thermal co coal and a shift away from using energy to support an industry in which it has no real advantages and significant disadvantages, concerns about cheap Chinese competition has declined over time. Well, CF does have an advantage with lower North America feedstock pricing. Some of the impact from annual uh, natural gas price fluctuations is mitigated by long-term contracts. Update. Uh, currently, CF regularly um, applies winter hedges to avoid severe weather-based distribution in natural gas prices. Demand for nitrogen fertilizer is fairly consistent due to it needing to be applied every year given that it is depleted via each harvest cycle. The write-up by Ruby831 provides some interesting historical perspective. CF was founded as a cooperative and owned by its customers, who in turn were agricultural, sorry, agricultural uh, cooperatives. Thus, their IPO had many correct characteristics similar to a demutualization. It appears the stock is up 19x since then. Turning to more recent developments, um, here are the highlights from the last two earnings calls, Q4 and Q1 from 23. Alongside these growth investments, we expect to continue returning substantial capital to shareholders. In 22, we return nearly 60% of our free cash flow, 1.65 billion to shareholders uh, through share repurchases and dividends. And in the last two years, we have reduced our outstanding share count by 11%. We expect to further leverage the $3 billion share repurchase program recently authorized by the board to continue building on this track record and provide and providing our long-term shareholders with ever-increasing participation in our business. Q4. The combination of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the large realignment of trade flows and very high natural gas prices in Europe and Asia combined to push global nitrogen prices to all-time highs in the spring of 22. The response from many agricultural buyers was to use a just-in-time approach to purchasing until prices weakened. CF began seeing more normalized purchasing behavior in February for this year as NOLA urea prices fell from 700 to 300 over the previous five months. CF expects industry fundamentals to fundamentals continue to point to a tight global nitrogen supply and demand balance. Regarding the 500 million annual Canadian tax bill and the related amended returns, all related to transfer pricing tax issues in which CF has filed amended returns for payments made from 2006 to 2011 seeking refunds from the US. We should begin to see initial payments globally in the 12th to 18th months um, with I would say a full res resolution of this anywhere made from 2006 to 2000, uh, sorry, from 36 to 48 months, depending on when both jurisdictions get to this item. While there's nothing uh, building going forward related to the tax issue, it did continue through 21. CF expects to get it all back via US refunds. The other thing is we did go ahead and make estimated payments for the period of 2012 uh, through 2021. In order to stop the interesting ticking, as Chris said, the Canada charges a much higher interest rate than the US. And so that's where some of the frictional costs come from. But our expectation is that we'll uh, get much of the money back. And again, the 6 and uh, through 11, money faster, uh, the rest of it is going uh, to, sorry, is going to likely have to go back to another round of arbitration when you're talking about 12 to through 21. But we are obviously going to put all efforts forward to recover as much of this as possible. Also in the Q4 call uh, in February, CF management made a good summary of the change in Chinese policy and why they continue to expect Chinese urea exports to be down on a year-over-year -year basis. I'd say the biggest thing that affects it is really one of the shifts of policy around trying to reduce environmental pollution in the country. There's recently, here since COVID, uh, there's also been a strong desire in order to help curve inflation around availability and affordability of nitrogen fertilizers and uh, so some pretty significant restrictions on exports. But in terms of, of 
in a loser export, uh, export restriction environment, the thing that gives us a, a lot of comfort around them not going back to sort of the old days is the real push around environmental cleanup and just environmental quality. Urea is a huge particulate matter amid or a big consumer of fresh water. There's not that many employment jobs that go along with it. And you're effectively exporting energy in the form of urea when you're turning around uh, and, important, uh, and importing natural gas. And it's uh, not a good trade from a policy perspective, but from the central government. On top of that, the Chinese market price is currently higher than the global market, eliminating any incentive to export uh, their tonnage. And during the Q1 earnings call on 5th and 2nd, 23, well, last year's unprecedented pricing environment has moderated, global industry dynamics remain favorable. Uh, global nitrogen demand that was priced out uh, of the market last year is returning and driven by the need to replenish grain stocks. At the same time, forward price curves suggest that energy spreads between North America and high-cost producers in Europe and Asia will continue to be significantly wider than historical averages. As a result, we expect to continue to generate substantial free cash flow. We expect this to be an active fertilizer season. Application season in 23 with corn acres in the US expected to be up about 5% and wheat acres about up around 9% compared to 22 Income at the farm gate in the United States and Canada is historically high, underpinned by an extended period of low grain stocks to use ratios, supporting high, high crop prices, as you can see on slide 9. We continue to believe that this will uh, take two growing seasons at trend yields to replenish global grain stocks. This would support agricultural-led demand as growers seek to optimize nitrogen applications and maximize returns. That said, over the next seven to eight weeks, the entire value chain will be walking a logistics tight rope due to the purchasing delays. Regarding the impact of ESG initiatives, what we saw back in 2012 was something like 26 or 27 announced new projects in North America, of which only four of them got built. Two of them by us and two other ones, all of them uh, were built by traditional industry participants. So a lot of the speculative plants that we're talking about never materialized. And I would expect that same dynamic to happen here. But I think it's an excellent question, one of the th of those things that we are evaluating and thinking about. And one of the things that I'm also excited about is the Wegerman acquisition. It gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of how we think about continuing to grow our own decarbonized ammonia platform base and different levers in terms of how to achieve that while having the same kind of S&D balance in the industry and not overwhelming kind of a marketplace. So I think we're in a really good position. I think North America is clearly the place uh, where these projects will get built and should get built because um, both of uh, the huge natural resource base, uh, low access to low cost and natural gas, but also the ability to do carbon capture and sequestration and the in incentive structures in the 45Q, uh, so more to come. But I think there's a lot of vaporware, vaporware uh, announcements out there right now. More of these clean energy initiatives? I think a lot of the new demand that we are looking at for ammonia as a clean energy source it is much more likely to be kind of longer term, contract, contractually based with a rateable, sorry, with rateable offtake and a return profile that's attractive based on either the acquisition price of the assets or uh, the build construction if it's a new build. And so our expectation is that we believe that we're in the best operator of these kind of assets in the world. We operate in one of the lower cost regions that's incentive structures out there from a legislative perspective and access to some great patterns like we have with ExxonMobil and others to help us achieve blue ammonia. And so from that perspective, uh, we think uh, that we can earn a re really attractive rate of return on incremental capital that we are putting in the ground on these kind of projects. And it's likely to be much more kind of rateable and fixed rate of return that is that is that it is subject to some of the volatility in the fertilizer space. And so uh, we think that adding some of those layers of attractive fixed margin returns will be a pretty additive to the overall valuation of the enterprise going forward. 
will continue to generate some good cash flow uh, for us that we can deploy either against share repo or appropriate growth projects when we find opportunities to continue to generate those rates of return. So we'll probably see us doing more of that kind of thing, particularly uh, as this new demand source emerges. Finally, the pace of share buybacks um, should come back strongly through the rest of the year now that we have completed the recent Wegman acquisition. The first quarter was heavily influenced by the fact that we are in a pretty advanced conversations for most of that quarter and therefore we were blacked out uh, from being able to do buybacks and then we were able to kind of jump in after the announcement went out the door and participate a little bit. I think we feel very comfortable uh, about the amount of cash generation that we expect uh, through the balance of this year plus a sizable amount of cash on hand even after we if uh, even after we consummate the Wagaman purchase. And so we have a large share repurchase authorization in front of us that the board just put in place. But one of the things that we have seen is despite, despite having what from a historical standpoint is a very strong Q1, including very cash, very strong cash generation, share price volatility that seems to trade on all kinds of other factors and we are committed to taking advantage of those dips opportunistically in a way that really uh, rewards our longer term shareholders in a very substantial way. And so what you'll probably see is us diving in deeper and harder on the clips and less so when we're trading relatively flatter. But I think taking over a year or two year period that should really disproportionately reward those that stay with us. Admittedly, the next 12 months won't match the previous 12 months of a free cash flow or earnings. However, the elements are still in place for robust demand and pricing dynamics going out at least two years. Even as pricing has relatively normalized, the demand due to restoring food, food stocks should continue to be supportive of a CF's market position. Catalyst. Continued recognition of the high free cash flow characteristics. Realization of the market economy, um, dichotomy um, that has left high free cash flow stocks at revaluation levels. Resumption of aggressive share purchases, repurchases. Thank you very much for tuning in. See you next time. Please write down in the comments below what you think of this item.